Hello, you're listening to the K-12 Tech Podcast, bringing you insights into the world of education technology. Stay tuned as we discuss the past, the present, and most importantly, the future of technology in our schools. All right, I'm excited today for the K-12 Tech Podcast to have Alana Nguyen, the Director of Education Technology at Kappa Unified in Orange County, California. Thanks for being on. Hi, how are you? Thank you for having me. It's my first podcast, so excited to be here today. All right, you're famous. Your first one. Well, we're excited to, I'm excited to take this journey with you. Um, you know, we got connected on LinkedIn and love what you were doing in your district. So let's, let's start, let's just kind of start from the beginning. I like to do it with everybody. I love people where they came from and how they got into the position they're in. So why don't you walk me through when you knew you wanted to be in education and maybe where your um, specialty in technology or your advancement in that side kind of brought you to where you are today. Absolutely. So I, I always say I'm probably pretty lucky because I knew I wanted to be a teacher since I was in first grade. And that's not typical of people, but I know personally I wanted to become a teacher because I was a EL student or I didn't know English until I started um, school. And so my first grade teacher was just one of those people who really inspired me to help others. And so that's where I led my educational journey, where it started. Um, but so I started as an elementary school teacher um, for about six years. And during that time, um, I got my master's in ed tech. I knew I was really curious about technology and I knew it would be really helpful for my students at some point. Um, so then after I got my master's, I was interested in supporting not just my students, but really looking at impacting students on a larger scale. And so I was actually fortunate that my superintendent at the time, very small district in Sacramento, um, he was like, I actually went up to him and said, hey, I really think that's important to have some sort of ed tech support at each of our school sites. We have an English learner person in the school site. We definitely need an ed tech person at the site. And during that time was when Chromebooks did not, was not on the scene yet. I think iPads were still there. I was using um, little iPod minis in my classroom. So really wanting to integrate technology in some way or form. And so that's what I asked him to do. And surprisingly, he actually listened and we were able to have some sort of a technology person in the district. And so with that experience, um, I was able to move down into um, an ed tech TOSA, teacher and special assignment position. And for a new district in Southern California here, actually, um, where we opened um, the Wonder Woman Chromebook program about nine, 10 years ago. So kind of jumping into a place where Chromebooks were brand new and really looking forward to helping support teachers because I knew, you know, it's new technology. How do we help our teachers and students be um, proficient with the technology? So from there, I was able to be a TOSA working with teachers, administrators, all sorts of learning tools. Um, I then became the director of ed tech um, where in San Diego for our unified school district. So um, for six years there, I was able to really support our team, was really able to transform teaching practices, continuing with one-to-one -one program, and really um, working with teachers and students again to really integrate technology in a meaningful way. So this past year, I am now at Capistrano Unified in, um, again, Orange County in the same position and really excited to, again, share my experience with what I've learned through the years of just kind of the ed tech piece, professional learning, kind of honing in those specific topics that really help teachers and students really shift and shift their learning, really. And I know with AI right now, that's kind of the new thing, really continuing to make changes and shift as technology always changes and really there to support teachers and students. So that's really been my passion background. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And um, yeah, well said. So a couple of things you want to unpack. Like you said, you, you were bilingual, so you didn't learn English until you started school. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that journey? Because one thing I, I, I've learned from people in technology is they're very resilient in general and they have to teach themselves a lot of new things. It is like an emerging field. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're now like 12 years ago when it was just iPads or just iPods, right. and these, you know, maybe some laptops. And then can you talk a little bit about maybe how that helped you on this journey? Or did that help with like elasticity of learning or anything like that? Definitely. Well, I was actually born here in the U.S., but my parents wanted to just teach me just or I only spoke Vietnamese until I went to school. So I think being um, 
bilingual or being fluent in that language, then when I went to school, it did help that transfer of language. And so using that understanding as I became a teacher, that really helped me understand working with my student population. So really understanding that piece of it. But when I started teaching and some of my districts have been Title I, which is for there are a lot more English learner students. And I'm also in other districts where um, it's not as diverse. But being able to understand that perspective that students learn in different ways has been really helpful. So, you know, a strategy that might help, you know, what they call an English learner does help all students. So, for example, I always think of this example of um, when I'm working on a Google Doc, the voice to text piece. So for some students, that might be helpful for them because they're, you know, they're learning English or they're learning a new concept. So really looking at the use of tools to support students in different ways and really understanding there's just different needs. Everybody learns in a different way. So that has really helped me kind of share my experience with other teachers to then help their students. So that's really important. So you, you had talked about early on in your career, um, getting your master's in education and technology, um, obviously years ago. What was that focused on then? Because one-to-one -one devices were not super common. It doesn't sound like at that time. What were they focused on then? And what did they think the future was then? Absolutely. Um, so that's exactly what you said. Uh, we called it Web 2.0 tools. And so there were some web quest activities where you're learning how to create a web quest. Um, I had to create, I had to learn Dreamweaver and um, oh create my, my own website. I can play my which, um, like Dreamweaver. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm like, oh, I know Dreamweaver. Um, we kind of looked at different ways of, you. I think smart boards were at that time was pretty big. So kind of looking at different tools. Um, they're really looking at just interesting. Um, really just important, to, uh, really important to say smart boards. When you say smart board, you don't mean interactive panels. You mean it's a whiteboard that uses a projector that allows you to like write on it. Right. Remember the Promethean boards, whatever the different brands yeah. they had at the beginning. So I know some districts at the time had it. I personally, my school district, I started teaching at, we had overhead. So it was really that discrepancy of some districts had funding to have all these tools and some didn't. So it was interesting um, looking back at that time period. Um, and we learned a lot about, it was interesting to learn about Siri, kind of just different. Now we call it AI now, but at the time it's just people are not alone with any more technologies kind of around us. So I'm trying to think back to other classes we had, but it wasn't one-to-one -one how to teach in a one-to-one environment, kind of that web 2.0 concept. So it's interesting. Yeah. What was it like? Um, walk me through what were the big initiatives, your first um, position as director of education technology, and what were your initiatives? Because I'm guessing it was a lot more hardware and personal development. And then what did you learn? And then what's new about going to maybe a, a massive district in that level? Yeah, absolutely. So I know um, in my first, um, in my position as director at Tech, um, one of the things that was really big when I was at TOSA was that just learning about the tool, really thinking about, you know, how to use Google Docs, Google Drive. So it's more about the tool. But I know when I became a director, it was really thinking about how do these tools support what you're doing in the classroom. So then um, our team really had to shift our thinking and really focusing on those innovative teaching practices. So blended learning for those it's a term that's been around for a while but really looking at the use of technology and how it's meaningful and how we can blend it together and it's not about being on the computer all day long it's how do you support learning with the device so really shifting um that mindset of it's not about the tool it's about how you use the tool is what i would say and we built our professional learning model around that concept and so and that changes you know year to year there's new practices different things they're really focusing not about the tool. What do you think was your biggest barrier in that area? Was it an older teacher generation that wasn't used to that transition and buy-in or, or I know sometimes, uh, sometimes teacher unions come up as being a difficult thing to work through. Can you talk a little bit about what those barriers were and maybe some ways you guys overcome? Absolutely. Well, I know one of the biggest barrier was that um, we were not one-to-one -one at that time. So in one district I was in, we were one-to-one. -one. Awesome. Nope. It was, the shift was different. Um, but then we weren't always one-to-one -one in my second district. And so that was one barrier. 
to. I think it took some time, but like you said, buy-in is huge. And so it really took you know, the ed tech department, really working with our curriculum services department, really helping making sure they understand the importance of it. Because I think as a whole, if, if everyone's on board, understands what the focus is, then it's easy to be able to continue to roll out those different, you know, learning strategies or innovative practices. But if you don't have the buy-in from the leadership, right? Um, I was fortunate to work with awesome leaders who really had that, you know, strategic thinking behind technology and integration. And so with that vision, we are able to then be able to support that work. But without that, you know, initial focus, it is tricky to be able to district-wide, you know, strategically be able to support and also the size of the district, right? If, depending on how much um, how many schools you have to support, how many on your team um, of support, you know, either TOSAs or we call them innovation coaches. Um, that was also an issue because there's never enough coaches to be able to support yeah. district-wide. Interesting. So going from a, a really small district to now a large district, what, what's been the biggest difference you've seen? Is it faster moving? in a smaller compared to a larger, or are there more funds potentially in a larger district, which helps amplify that process? Uh, well, here in California, funding is based on the demographics of like we call the LCAP. And so um, it doesn't depend on the size of the district, it depends on the, you know, the area. So in my current district and my previous district, um, we do not get the same funding that I, that I received from my previous two districts. So it kind of depends on where you're, you know, the budget piece of it. Um, but I know that um, it's just one of those unrealistic, it's one of those things that's, that we're having to work through. So when you have different bu budget um, pieces to it, then you have to be more creative how you push out things. So, or you're only able to do so many things based on what is allocated. So it kind of depends on the piece. What, what are the things um, when, when you're a district that don't have the funds um, what are considered essentials and then what are considered we would love to, if we had the funding, this is what we'd love to do. Um, um, it's like a good topic because like there's some districts that are like the technology department is just getting hammered all the time. Be like, sorry, hey, we need funding. No, keep the Chromebooks going, you know, and that's it, right? And then, but then you have districts that have a lot of money, like interactive panels, uh, we're going to hire consulting firms to come in and, you know, everything. What does that look like? Um, like the things that are like considered the essentials, the things that are considered, um, you know, like, uh, hey, this is on our roadmap when we can. Get right. Um, I believe, well, in my experience, um, definitely believe that, that professional learning is huge. It's important when you're rolling out any sort of um, program that requires technology. So um, if you're going to have devices, then it'd be important to have support for those things because, you know, we, not everyone, for example, not all teachers are, um, they need the additional support, you know, with to engage students with new learning practices or pedagogy. So I think it's really important to be able to have professional learning as a, as a rock, I would believe. But I know um, sometimes it's tricky when it's a larger district or, um, I'm new in this district, so I have lots of ideas, but it's really important to be able to, to have that support. But I definitely believe that um, ed tech and IT departments really work well together. Um, really, so especially in this day and age now, we need to work together so that we can support teachers moving forward. So then that way you have um, you know, both sides to be able to give the best support for teachers. Yeah, yeah I love that. Um, when we were doing our introductory call, we talked a little bit about AI, professional learning. Um, and you, I mean, every state's different. California obviously is one of the largest, I mean, it is a, maybe it is the largest populated state in the United States. It's bad that I don't know that. Yes. Something like that. Um, it, in, in California, has there been any policy specifically around AI and education that maybe is more specific to you that you know of? And then how are you incorporating it in your district? Oh, absolutely. So I know um, it's due for everyone, right? It's only been a year. So I know currently in my district, um, when I first started, um, the ed tech team that was already here has already, had already started doing um, some professional learning for teachers and really sharing out what it's about. And I think as it continues to shift so quickly, um, as I shared, um, 
for Orange County Department of Ed, they were offering some different um, workshops that we were learning. So we were able to join that piece. There's some future AI trainings or um, conferences that um, our, our team's going to. So I know it's happening. Um, it's really important that I mean, my goal is to work with other ed tech directors in our county to really see what they're doing. And so I had some um, other districts I'm working with as well to kind of see what their roadmap is. And our goal as our district is to really create some sort of a, a task force or a tech committee plan to really look at the different, to one, look at AI, see what the uses are, really be able to support teachers. So kind of a roadmap for what's next. And I definitely think um, next on the, would be some sort of um, board information or stuff to share out so that everyone's kind of on the same page, but we're all kind of working at the same place. And it sounds like um, we're going to be opening up ChatGPT, for example, for our high school students in January. So that's something that we are open to, you know, for students. But really looking at how, again, working with teachers and students really show them how to use it in the appropriate way. You know, what's interesting is I know a lot of the concern that I've heard from the ed tech community has been like, um, kids not doing the work, the research or whatever is required. Cheating is a big one. So how, how has education been trying to combat that? Is it being able to, I know with Chromebooks, based on action points, you can restrict what's on a device um, and what comes up on a Chromebook or an iPad. Um, I know through IPs, you can just restrict it completely. Um, but when it comes to homework, do you think that there's going to be more writing required on like physical paper or how, how, how are you as a district talking about? Well, I definitely think, um, so speaking of Chromebooks, I know, um, there's no way to block every AI generated kind of program out there because if you block one, another will come up. And so... Our again, our goal is to think back to digital citizenship, really looking at how our district's working on creating some specific AI digital citizenship lessons to one, again, remind students like why, you know, digital footprint and all those things. We're really looking at it as a tool not to, you know, to mitigate some of that the cheating piece. Um, I know turnin.com is something that we use in our district. And one of the things that we've shared as the ed tech department is really it's this conversation starter. You have students using the the tool. You know, how can we have that conversation with that student to start that you know that relationship to be able to kind of pinpoint why the student might be using it. So really, again, sharing about it versus saying no, you can't use it because I think that's where there's a lot of things that could happen. And so there's no way to block everything. We are one to one as well. And so our job is just to inform and really again really focus on how to use it in a meaningful way. Moving forward, and I think going back to that, teachers may have to shift how they do homework or how they, you know, create lessons or activities for students to do. How do we use? How do we use these types of tools to benefit that work, not to not use that particular? Yeah, it's like it's like when handheld calculators became like a right. How with this tool there, it's like. You know, I remember there used to be a saying, I, 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 it's come up, just their memes and stuff, how like people back in the 80s and 90s were like, oh, you're not going to have a calculator on you at all times. And, right. then, and then, oh, like, you have your cell phone and it's the most powerful calculator you know, ever created. And then exactly. now, not, not only do you have a calculator, I have like, I pay for the premium version of ChatGPT. I've got the mm-hmm. app, right. which I don't even have to do math. I can just say what right. I'm thinking like verbally, it'll just do it for me. So it's like, there is a sense to where I can understand completely how people are fearful of people losing their ability to reason Mm -hmm. because they're not having to do the research. It's just kind of like perfectly coming to them. Um, But the problem is, is I can't even go to a Google search bar anymore because it's so bad compared to going to a a chat bot, an AI chat bot. So it, I, it's interesting when I did a deep dive because I was thinking about how is this going to change education? I think number one, it added a ton of value to the one-to-one environment. Right. Yeah. Massive. Because if you're a teacher who might not be the most technologically advanced, you can do so much work for you right. quickly. Secondly, I think, it, I think it bridges a cultural gap 
to be able to relate to people who are much younger. Um, just with my boys, just my, my, my kids trying to explain to them, like, oh, what are my kids? What? A little Pokemon. Okay. Right. And be like, hey, let's do like a math problem using Pokemon or using basketball or using things to relate to, to students and maybe to explain how, mm-hmm. I, like, if you remember, like, what am I going to use trigonometry right. on a day to day basis? If a teacher would have been like, hey, I, you know what? Boom, boom, boom. Here you go. Like, this is how, and this is the math behind it. I think creating, um, I think it's going to really help schools pull in a polytechnic way of learning easily around projects and stuff like that. All right. Hey, I want to create a project based on assembling this, um, this rocket. I want them to learn math. I want them to learn history. I want them to learn science. And guess what? I'm a teacher. I'm a fifth grade teacher. I don't know. I'm not not a genius on any of these. I know a little, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, that excites me because I would have learned 50x in yeah. school it would have been more like. Yes, I definitely think it allows you to personalize learning for students in a way that you wouldn't have done before, right? Time's always a huge thing for teachers. And so if you have a tool like ChatGBT or there's so many other ones out there, I think Magic AI is one that Magic School Bus, I think I forget the name of it, the teachers love because it helps with lesson planning. Um, how you're, you're able to not only personalize it for a couple of students, but for all your students. And that would be such a great way to remove time that you had planned, but now you're working with students individually on their projects. So I think, like, as you were sharing, that's a great way to be able to maximize your time and also support the students in your classroom because they're all, everyone's different. Everyone likes different things. So. Okay. So I have a controversial question for you. Okay. <laughs> um, what? Bring AI, bring chat GPT. What areas of education do you think that that's going to disrupt? Meaning something that was used a lot by teachers, used a lot by administrators that will not be used now. Not, not used now, but will be transitioned out. Especially especially with, uh, the, I don't even know if they've officially announced it. It sounds like Microsoft is going to fully absorb open AI, which I think is kind of like the end game for them. and. I think that will add a lot of validity to it being used at an enterprise level. We're on the waiting list to be on the enterprise. Um, I'm curious though, in education, where do you think that, I think a lot of people are talking about all the the great things, but a lot of people are talking about like, oh, like all these things that used to be done are going to be obsolete. Well, just the first one you said, that was like, for example, handwriting, right? Cursive writing. That's one of the examples where everything's digital, right? And so we're, not writing as much, but obviously it's still an important piece. I'm curious. I know I'm just, I'll think of writing for now for as an example. Like I know you would peer at it. You would be able to have other people look at your writing. With the use of AI, you have that kind of built in to have that feedback for you. So um, as much as you want collaboration, that could, you know, could have less opportunities to speak. So that's where as a teacher, you'd want to make sure you build in that time for collaboration or communication with students. For, that might be an example if you're using it for other things. Uh, what about for, I'm thinking about like coding, like in the past if you had to learn how to code, but now with the newest version, right? Or the paper, you can just put in the code and it gives it for you. You would have to understand if that code's correct or not, right? You still have that foundation. Yeah. You still need that foundation, but some of that, might be already done for you now with AI. Yeah, that was that was like one of the bigger takeaways. Someone's like, oh, it codes. And I'm like, oh, sweet. I don't know how to code, but it can code for me. And I realized yeah. like, this is worthless if I don't know, number one, how to apply. And number one, how to develop it's right. Like I'm pretty good yes. at, like even now still with the premium version, it still consistently messes up math. Right. So you have to like, if you don't have good general knowledge to know like that seems wrong, right. it can still lead you down the wrong path. So there's still going to be a lot of need for interaction and it'll get better over time. Um, but you're right. I think the base level of coding. So I think probably the education around coding will think right. this is how you write code. Uh, this yeah, is how you understand code. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm also thinking about images because all those image cre- generators. Yeah, Dolly. I don't have a real photo anymore. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's going to be, that's going to be interesting. I don't know if you've seen it all. Um, Meta's new um, VR AI stuff that they're doing. Not yet. Yeah. There was uh, basically, you know, Meta came out. They wanted to be this 3D, 4D world. I don't know how you explain it, but um, uh, Lex Friedman is a very famous podcaster and um, uh, Mark was the CEO of Facebook. Okay. Yeah, he, you know, he was on there and they were interviewing and it looked like they were sitting in the same room, but actually they were both thousands of miles away on VR and they do 3D images of your body. Right. Really, like it, it inputs you like in this environment where you can interact with others. It, it, it's pretty insane. But I wonder how that's going to change. Maybe, right. maybe teachers won't even need to be in the classroom anymore. Who knows? Like maybe they're maybe no, everyone no. is at no, home. Right. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I I'm curious if homeschooling is going to become. When I say homeschooling, I mean students being able to stay home and do school, right through this 3D AI environment. I definitely think that will lead to different pathways. I do understand. Um, I think there's still that important piece of the in-person education part, but I think it allows more opportunities for students who may not learn the best in that way, or maybe have other things going on. That I definitely think that piece will be helpful for those students. So I think if anything, I mean, it will help students, but then it will change a little bit. So who knows how that will pull out a bit. So you mentioned something earlier, and I'm just so curious about this, that Orange County Schools overall school government has a new position called the AI coordinator. Can okay. you explain what that job's response? That's the first time I've heard I've heard of that being in a in a district. So um as part of um as one of the districts in uh, Orange County, I know uh, a fellow colleague of mine had just gotten this position um as the administrator for innovation and artificial intelligence. So very new position, but I know um some of the work that our team has done, there's been other districts that have had a, that have an AI coordinator. So it's just, I'm, I'm thankful that we have someone in place for Orange County to be able to kind of help, you know, connect that work. Because I think what's important is that everyone's kind of in the same place, but now there's a resource to connect as a whole. So I just think that's important. And the position's absolutely brand new. So I think, you know, I'll connect you with him, if anything. Um, but it's just a great way, a great resource, and to be able to have that support as we're moving forward in this the school year. Yeah, that seems yeah. like a very, very good use of a position to know that you have somebody who's got a vested interest and their sole focus is how are we implementing this? Are we thinking through these positions? Because I don't think that's fair for a superintendent with everything they have going on. Even a tech director, right. they've got. 90, 90, you know, they're, they're already 110%, you know, overloaded. Yes. You, that does make sense that there would be somebody, especially at a large level, maybe in the smaller states, there would be like regions where they help that. That does make sense, especially for the implementation and, and then for security reasons. Right. Packed, and then someone who can lead those conversations with administrators. I thought that was fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the last piece you brought up was professional learning. Can you talk maybe in, in detail on what professional learning looks like and what you're trying to do at your district? And then what is a good outcome from that? Definitely. I know um, as a result of COVID, some of the things that I know in my previous work through this district, um, we really had to kind of shift the model of professional learning. So, and there's been a lot of research, right, that if you go to a PD, a training, you don't get that just a small percentage of information that you actually will take back with. You might take a couple of nuggets with you, but um, for the implementation piece, it's really important to have that ongoing professional learning support. And so with that in mind and with, you know, with, hap- with everything happening with COVID, using video conferencing is a really great, um, you know, option um, in person, obviously, and then the async option. So I think one, for professional learning is giving the different modes of learning for teachers. And so really utilizing those um, examples. So here in Capo Serrano Unified, um, our district's huge and we only have two toe sets. And so we cannot be in every school set. We cannot train every single teacher, every um, 
every department or team. So we do use some of that asynchronous professional learning options where we create something, we create that module and teachers are able to do that learning on their own time. So that's something that's been, has to happen or we use, you know, the video recordings and things like that. So I think the end goal of professional learning is really looking at some of the work that I've done this year is looking at some of the tools that we have in our current district that we pay for. And when it comes to tools, um, it's really important to be able to decide the professional learning to go with it. And so we've been offering different menus of different tools tied to innovative practices or teaching practices. And because of our small team, really focusing on those, you know, four to five, six tools that we're focusing on and then giving schools choice. So then they can choose some different options of learning that will then support them in the classroom. So we've been kind of had to be creative with our time and, you know, being able to be with all school sites, but really giving that choice, whether it's in person or async, but really the goal is that we're focusing on the different tools that are support for our district. So kind of a process there. Yeah. What, um, when teachers go through that training that you're creating in those video modules, is there a way for you to know who's done it? Is there certifications? How do you hold teachers accountable and give them something kind of like, um, give them at least like record, like, hey, you've gone through this training. And then is there is there anything you're doing district wide for you to see what improvements like were made, any numbers being moved? I know. And Many of the districts I've been in, everyone has different models of capturing that. And so I know um, here at Capo, we have um, we use a program called Frank Learning, where we are able to build out that professional learning module. And so when teachers go into it, they sign it, they have an account. So it keeps track of those learning opportunities. So we then see it. Um, we can see the data on who's done it, who's, you know, who's completed that work. And then we're able to then transfer it to I believe teachers here earn um, credits. Um, I have to be correct. They earn um, or they earn time for that information they are the, they're learning. So um, say they went old district has similar process. They log in their time and they get a reward for it. So kind of different in every district, but it's the opportunity for them to then get some continuing education ongoing. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, that's amazing. Thank you. And thank you for all you're doing for your district. And I'm excited to see, you know, it, it seems like you're doing really big things. I'm excited to see where your career ends. And I'm sure you're not even close to being done. So, oh. that's awesome. <laughs> well, thanks so much for being on the K 12 Tech podcast. And I'm excited to see where your career goes. Thank you so much. 